do want to welcome each one of you to our midweek Bible study here at Westside. Uh, whether you're joining us online or here in person, especially anyone who may be visiting with us tonight, um, we're grateful for your presence and, and we look forward to continuing our study through the book of Hebrews as uh, Steve Choate leads us. Do we have just a few announcements tonight? Have uh, some new ones, we have some, some repeats and then and we have some, some good reports for people on, on whose behalf we've been praying. Um, so we always love to announce those. Uh, first of all, Joanne Clay was able to have uh, laser eye surgery on her left eye last Thursday, and everything went great. And says her vision has already improved. So we're thankful uh, for the good news that Joanne received. And then Rayla Clay has has finally been able to have her heart surgery scheduled. And as of right now, that's scheduled to take place on Wednesday, April the 17th. So we want to continue to remember the Clay family at this time. Uh, and then Fred Duncan, who we announced was admitted to the hospital last Wednesday, was able to return home on Friday. And he'll have a follow-up appointment with his doctor uh, tomorrow, March 21st. So we want to keep Fred in our prayers. Uh, that, that he will continue to improve and, and that his treatments will continue to go well. And then Michelle Patterson, who we announced last Wednesday, is doing much better after having her abdominal infection. I saw Michelle here tonight and it looked like she was doing pretty good, not going to have to have surgery, so we're thankful for that. Um, Henry Terrell had an appointment yesterday to, uh, regarding surgery for his pro uh, prostate cancer. And as of right now, it looks like they're still kind of still consulting. Uh, hopefully, Henry will know more at the end of April. So we want to continue to remember Henry, uh, his family, and his medical team as they discuss the best options for him. Melinda Wiley was, un uh, was able to undergo her knee replacement on Monday. Everything went well, and she was able to go home yesterday. So we can continue to remember Melinda that she'll heal well, that her rehab will will go well and that she will get back to her normal health as soon as possible. And then Joe Raines, the father of, of Tim Patterson, we mentioned last week had a stroke Friday, March 8th. He is currently in uh, inpatient rehab at Unity Health South and says progressing quickly and in therapy terms, that's good news. So we wanna continue to pray for Joe that his recovery will, will go well. And then Harrison West, who's been on our announcements a number of times through the years, that's the great-grandson of Helen Harris, had a severe seizure on uh, Thursday the 14th of this month. He is at Arkansas Children's, uh, says he's recovering well, has not suffered any major side effects from the seizure. Uh, so we want to thank God for that and, and continue to pray for his complete healing. Uh, says if everything goes well, he's on pace to go home this weekend. So. Uh, that would be great uh, for the West family. Uh, so that is our prayer list. We do want to make uh, mention of some of the events coming up this week. If you are in the SALT group, that's a singles group. As we mentioned, there will be dinner and fellowship on Friday, this coming Friday, March 22nd, at the home of Jay and Becca Crook. Uh, their address is, is in the bulletin. That will begin at 635. There is a sign-up sheet in the Welcome Center. Uh, if you plan to attend that, and then Naomi Secrets would be the one to uh, contact with any questions you have regarding this event or any, any events pertaining to the singles group. If you're in care groups three or six, there will be a combined potluck this Sunday that'll take place in the annex after morning services. So as to bring a dish to share and come for a time of fellowship, care groups three and six. Uh, we do have an announcement just making us aware that the, the sharing shop, which is a thrift store that benefits the Searchy Children's Home, has new, moved to a new location, and that's at 1549 East Race next to Firehouse Subs. And the, their hours of operation uh, is available in the bulletin as well as that address. Uh, we do want to remind you of the gospel meeting that's going to take place at the Foothills Church. Um, this beginning this Sunday, they're starting with their Bible class hours at 9.30. Um, then they'll have, uh, after worship, there'll be a potluck and then an early uh, afternoon service beginning at 1.30 on Sunday, and then nightly meetings at 7 uh, through Wednesday. And then in addition to that, there's a new announcement, the Southside Church of Christ, um, just south of, of uh, Batesville, will have a gospel meeting beginning Friday, April 5th. It starts at 7 p.m. and will run through their 
a potluck after the Sunday morning worship at 10 a.m. on the uh, Sunday, April 7th. And Kenny Townsley will speak on the topic of getting in God's way. So it would be great to support some of our brothers and sisters at these upcoming meetings um, if you're able to do that. And then just a reminder, the wedding shower honoring Kelly McKinnon, that's the bride-elect of Ben Sloan, will take place this Sunday, March 24th from 1.30 to 3 at the home of Ray Ann Story. Ben is the son of Ellis and Lori Sloan and the grandson of Treva Pryor. Uh, the times, the addresses, uh, information regarding registries is available in the bulletin. If, you, if you're interested in that, be sure and pick up a copy of the bulletin. Um, before we turn things over to Brandon, who'll have our song here in just a moment, let's go to God in prayer on behalf of these. Dear Heavenly Father, we do come before you tonight with, with gratitude in our hearts for the beauty of the day, Lord, the blessing of being able to assemble with one another, the blessing of, of being able to study your word. Lord, I ask a special blessing on each one that we've mentioned that is struggling with health concerns. We are thankful for the good reports that several have gotten, Lord, and we just ask that you continue to act on their behalf, Lord, and, and we just, we know what a blessing it is uh, to have good health, and Lord, we just pray for these, that you will continue to be with them, be with their families, the medical teams that are ministering to them, and Lord, we just pray that if it be your will, that each one can be returned to their wanted health as soon as possible. We do ask a, a special measure of your blessing on Steve tonight as he continues to guide us through the study of your word, Lord. We just ask that everything that is said and done is in accordance with your will. And, and not only Steve, but each one who's taken on the role of, of teaching tonight, Lord, that you will bless them. And we're thankful for so many capable uh, people that are willing to give of, the, of their time and their talents uh, to share, share your word with each one of us. Lord, we just ask that you go with us throughout the remainder of this time together, that you will bless us, that you will forgive us when we fall short, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven are what I can see. When my Lord is living in me, I know Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he missed me. Green grass and flowers all blooming in springtime are works. The master I live for each day, I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. Tall mountains, green valleys, beauty that surrounds me all make me aware. The one who made it all, I know that Jesus is well alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be alone since he promised me that we never would part. Caught me making a last-minute note to self. <laughs> well, good evening to everyone. I hope that everyone is doing well and has had a good week. As ever, thank you, Eric and Brandon, for uh, your helping me here tonight. So for those online, welcome. This is a series of studies that uh, I'm leading on Hebrews, and tonight our focus will be on chapter 9. So let me make sure this is turned on. Okay, I got too many markers. 
I need a bigger brain or a bigger lectern, <laughs> one or the other. <laughs> okay, so uh, Hebrews chapter 9. And uh, as I have been recapping, giving just a, a brief summation of each of the chapters that we've considered so far, so we'll open up uh, with that tonight. So uh, the whole point, remember, is the superiority of Christ and uh, the new covenant. And so chapter one is Christ is superior to the angels. Chapter two, his authority is supreme in that he is the son of God and that he did God's will. Chapter three, as the son of God, Christ is superior to Moses. Chapter four, there remains a rest for God's people. Chapter five, Christ is our high priest. Chapter six, stand fast, be faithful. God is faithful and Christ is our high priest. Chapter seven, Christ is ordained by God of the order of Melchizedek. Chapter eight, uh, last week, the old law has been superseded by the new law. And to give you the uh, short version of tonight's lesson, chapter 9 is really a continuation of that theme. There's a good deal of symbolism here, but the basic message is the superiority of the new covenant, uh, the fleshly, uh, as opposed to the fleshly covenant, the old covenant, the, uh, the time of Moses and the Mosaical law. And uh, if I could make one other allusion here, I, I appreciate Brother Nathan's metaphor that the Bible is uh, really something that a child could wade through, and yet, using that metaphor, whales can swim. And uh, that's, I think, an apt metaphor, because in one sense, this is very basic, a very basic message. As I've said, the superiority of the new covenant bought by the blood of Christ, as opposed to the old covenant, the Mosaical law and its traditions uh, that deal with the blood of sheep and goats and bulls. And uh, that's, that's the simple version. Uh, we will go a little deeper than that, but if you get nothing more out of uh, what I'm saying tonight than that, then you, you will have gotten the, the gist of the message because that's, that's the, basic, uh, the basic message here. Now, having said that, let me warn all of you. This is a chapter that is filled with blood. Uh, no less than 12 times in, I think, 28 verses, references made to blood. And uh, what's a guy who's into visuals to do with that? So uh, there are going to be some drips and drops and sprinkles and gushes from time to time. I hope nobody's stomach gets turned, but there is a lot of blood in the Old Testament because there's a lot of sacrificing of animals. And the Hebrews author in dealing with this matter does not stint references to blood. So uh, just be aware of that. I think really I've been rather modest, but uh, still for the point of the message, uh, I will be using uh, things that represent reference and even graphically portray blood. So another connection from last week, and I think it's very apt. Uh, I was dealing with chapter eight, which I think in many ways sets the tone and uh, Chapter 9 continues the argument begun in chapter 8. And so uh, I was referencing Paul's writing to the Galatian brethren because I think what uh, the Hebrews author is saying in chapter 8, it reminds me so much of Paul, uh, where Paul says, chapter 3, verses 23 through 24, but before faith came, that is the faith that is part of the new covenant, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor. In the Greek, that is pedagogos, pedagogue, to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. So as I shared with you last Wednesday, this is uh, really an image that anyone in the ancient world 
would be able to understand because the pedagogue is the house slave whose special duty it is to ward, watch over, perhaps even instruct or tutor uh, the, uh, the children of the house, particularly the young sons, uh, as they are coming and going to their, to their formal tutor. And uh, so I slipped this work in last week right before we began, about an hour or so before I got here, because I thought it was such a great illustration and I bemoaned the fact that I could not find it in color while well, I found it. Good things come to those who persevere. And so I did my best at the time to describe the lustrous black uh, polish of the form and the rich red that uh, dramatically contrasts to that. And uh, so here is that skifos or the small drinking cup that I utilized last time. The pedagogue or pedagogus is of course this figure here. And uh, as this is a younger man, not just a little boy, the pedagogue is not leading the way but is walking a respectful distance behind carrying the lyre. Uh, that the uh, young man will be using in his, in his formal study. I mentioned to you that uh, uh, basically, as I understand it, the Greek education for young boys and men uh, would be, um, I think it's mathematics and rhetoric and music and then athletics. A great deal of time and effort invested in music, surprisingly. Uh, so, uh, why am I showing this to you tonight? Well, it's not just because I found it in color. I found the reverse side. And I thought this would be a great way to connect with last week's lesson, but also to set the stage for the continuation of that argument. Because the reverse side shows the Greek boy safely delivered to the tutor. So, the pedagogue has served the purpose intended and uh, the tutor now takes over. And uh, just so in this metaphor that Paul is using, the pedagogue is the old covenant. It brings us up to the point of Christ's sacrifice. The new covenant is established with his blood and now we are with the real teacher, with Christ and under the real covenant. So I thought that would be a wonderful way to, uh, to go into this material for tonight. And by the way, I do have the uh, live mic. So if anybody wants to make a statement, an observation, ask a question, uh, feel free to do that. Eric, I'm sure, will help us out. Okay, so uh, chapter 9. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service in the earthly sanctuary or uh, this is both supposed to be New King James. I guess I'll have to look at my cheat notes because uh, although both are supposed to be New King James, I just read from that. That's my Bible. This is a little bit different. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary for a tabernacle was prepared. So how could I resist that? So I found online uh, this... Um, recreation of the tabernacle and this is actually not it because I heavily doctored and changed it this is it without the cross section so I reconstructed the outer form of it and uh, incidentally uh, in my initial plans for this which were too ambitious I thought we would really look at this in some detail and uh, planned on going through Exodus and uh, the old law. And I didn't have the time to do that. So let me just let it suffice to say that if you want to go into the details that the Hebrews author is referring to here about the tabernacle and the various vessels and instruments that were part of it, I welcome you to, to turn back to Exodus 25 onward. Uh, and uh, that's where the introduction of the tabernacle is. I will say this, though. That's one of my markers. Uh, 
God is amazing in so many ways, and his word is amazing in so many ways. And in reviewing some of this material, it was brought again to my mind that some of the central craftsmen uh, who were blessed by God in order to accomplish the building of the tabernacle and to cast uh, and to, to make all of the various vessels that were consecrated to his service, their names are given. And uh, as an artist myself, I really think that uh, we should pause just a moment because we read in uh, Exodus chapter 35, verse 30, and Moses said to the children of Israel, see, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the spirit of God and wisdom and understanding in knowledge and all manner of workmanship to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting jewels for setting and carving wood, and to work in all manner of artistic craftsmanship. And he has put in his heart the ability to teach in him, and Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach of the tribe of Dan. He has filled him with skill to do all manner of work of the engraver and the designer and the tapestry maker in blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen, and of the weaver, those who do every work and those who design artistic works. And Bezalel and Aholiab are mentioned again by name in the first verse of the next chapter. They're mentioned a time or two after this as well. So uh, as an artist, I think that's an amazing thing, a wonderful thing, that these artists not only are specially gifted by God with a divine skill, literally given from God to these people, but... to commemorate the triumph of Titus and his father, the emperor Vespasian, over the uh, Jews uh, at the fall of, uh, fall of Jerusalem. So the menorah is a complex object, as you can see, a central branch, and then three branches on each side. Only pure olive oil, virgin olive oil, was supposed to be placed within this. It has, I think, many purposes and also uh, can be used to symbolize various things. Some maintain that the six branches represent human knowledge, with the central branch representing God's divine knowledge. 
Others maintain that this represents the seven days, and we're speaking about the six days of creation and then the seventh day of God's rest, and therefore the seventh day, the central branch, is uh, reflective of that, as well as the Sabbath, which is to be kept holy. And uh, then, as noted here, we have the table, and it's showbread. So this is uh, an important part of the, the tabernacle as well, and uh, is bread that is sanctified, consecrated, and supposedly only the priests can eat of it. We know that David's men were given of it uh, in David's flight from Saul. And then, uh, not specifically mentioned here, but uh, it is mentioned as being part of the Holy of Holies, is the golden censer. The altar of incense is in this recreation, in the sanctuary. And of course, sweet-smelling spices uh, were placed upon this altar. It's believed that they are intended to symbolize the praise of God's people rising up to God. And uh, so that concludes the sanctuary. So uh, now we can pull a apart the second veil, verse 3. And behind the second veil, and there we have pulled that aside, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all. Or in some translations, this is the holy of holies. And I think you... Uh, all know that I uh, am not myself very demonstrative, certainly not a theatrical person, but I do like a touch of the theatrical in my uh, PowerPoints. So I decided to abandon my cross section and uh, pull aside the second veil. And so there it is. <laughs> so we read uh, chapter nine, verses three through five, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all or the holy of holies, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. So it's called the mercy seat because that space between the wings of the cherubim is supposed to represent God's presence. And you may be wondering, where is the visual? Well, of course there's a visual. You just have to be patient. My visual overlapped some of my text. So uh, this is uh, an effort to recreate the Ark of the Covenant as described in uh, Exodus and in other places. And, of course, it's a great box. But uh, we're specifically told what's in it, so we can actually, with the aid of Photoshop, lift that up and pull those things out. So there are the Ten Commandments, and there is the pot, the golden pot that had manna in it, relics of the Exodus event that were intended to remind the people not only of God's law in a succinct form, but also of his provision for them through the bread that came from heaven, which is another symbol for Christ, as we know. And then also part of this ensemble and testifying to the miraculous power of God is Aaron's rod that budded. And uh, so those are the things that were in the Ark of the Covenant that made uh, this a very important object uh, in the Mosaical Law, the seat of God symbolically through his presence and so holy that only once a year would the high priest enter into this space. Well, sadly, uh, none of this, of course, has survived. We don't know exactly what happened to these objects once we get beyond the menorah and the things that were in the, the temple at the time of the Roman destruction in AD 70. The ark, uh, it's thought, was in existence until the time of the Babylonian captivity. So I believe Jeremiah was the last prophet who spoke of it. There are all kinds of theories about what happened to it, but most likely it was taken at the time of the Babylonian conquest sometime between 597 to 586 BC. Again, that's hypothetical. No one knows. 
My personal feeling is that God did not want this special object consecrated to his service in the old law to become an idol. And I think uh, had it survived, the probability of that happening would be very, very high indeed. So whether man destroyed it or God dealt with it uh, through human means or divine uh, is not really material. What matters is, as far as we know, it no longer is in existence. So that is the physical place and the physical objects and furniture that were part of the practices of worshiping God according to the old Mosaical law. So let's... Uh, shut it up and close the curtain again, because again, we cannot speak of these things at this time in detail. And uh, we will resume chapter nine, verses six through seven. Now, when these things had been thus prepared, the ark, the tabernacle, all of these other things, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. And as we go on, as I've said, this chapter is really filled with references to blood. I don't think we can really appreciate uh, the complexity of the ritual, even if you are a true biblical scholar and you know the old law. It is, after all, recorded for us and can be understood, I think. But I mean, no, in the sense of actually physically experience it, not just in terms of the lowing of the animals and the slaughtering of bulls and goats and doves and lambs, but uh, also all of the various offerings that, that were part of it, the grain offering, the drink offerings, and the interminable blood sacrifices which were not just poured out on the altar or burned up by the fire of the altar, but were also liberally sprinkled on the people and those worshipers who came to make offerings. And uh, the closest I've ever come to uh, really understanding this is, uh, I think I mentioned this in some class settings in much the same context, is that when I was quite young, in my early teens, my father and I went on a trip uh, to New Delhi, India. That was the base of his work for many, many years. And uh, while there, he would record sermons, and uh, brethren from all over India would come in to, uh, to record those with him in the native dialects. And he also uh, looked to various publishing needs during that time. But both coming and going to New Delhi, where we were based, uh, he made all kinds of pit stops in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in uh, Nepal. He, uh, everywhere he could, he would stop and he would visit with local brethren and uh, he would teach and preach and encourage uh, brethren as well as missionaries of the Lord's Church. And on this particular trip on our way home, we stopped in Nepal. Kathmandu, Nepal, uh, which is in the rugged Himalayas, the highest mountains in the world. Uh, we were actually there at a very interesting period of time because one of the major Hindu feasts was actually underway during that period. And I found it so ironic as a young man, again, I was in my teens, that uh, we my father and I and various local brethren were in a small house in the middle of crowded Kathmandu. And my father was holding almost around the clock. It wasn't literally around the clock, but it seemed like that to someone of my age. Uh, these, these lessons, uh, teaching them and working with them so they could more effectively teach and preach as well. And just outside, in fact, the very courtyard of the house we were in, uh, slaughtered animals were being burned in burned offerings in token of that Hindu uh, holiday. And not only that, but everywhere we went in Kathmandu during that, uh, that brief stay, it was only a couple of days, uh, animals were being butchered. Their blood was literally in the street. Flies were everywhere. 
the butchered carcasses of these animals, those that weren't burned up, were hanging from the stalls. If you think meat offered to idols is a thing of the past, I can tell you it is not. And the stench of the smell of the char and burn of the flies, of the, the smell of blood everywhere, that was an old world, ancient world experience. And uh, it powerfully bore home to me the contrast between the fleshly law and the spiritual law. Even though here I'm talking about, of course, pagan worship, the worship of idols and of false gods, still the basic means of engaging in that worship, sacrifice of animals, was the same. And uh, wow, it was a real experience. I, will, I don't think I'll ever forget it as long as I live. So that's one reason why I've indulged myself in this bowl of blood and why I'm going to be spattering various slides in this PowerPoint with drops of red because I don't want to offend anyone. I'm not going to come in and start literally sprinkling everybody with blood, but this would have been smelly, dirty, really very raw, very physical. And yet it was a daily part of the services of worship to God, the offering of sacrifice, the spilling of blood. So uh, chapter 9, well, it says verses 9 through 10, but this is 8 through 10. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. Now, I think here already he's making a transition from the tabernacle as a physical object, a tent, and the physical holiest of all or holy of holies to a spiritual holy of holies, to his own presence. When he says that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances, imposed until the time of Reformation. So I take that as simply as I know to take it, and that is that Christ's blood brings us into a state of oneness again with God through his sacrifice, and that was not available while the tabernacle, the fleshly uh, or the physical manifestation of the old law was in place that uh, this entering into the true Holy of Holies, God's presence, was symbolic during this period, and uh, that it was imperfect. It couldn't satisfy God's, God's desires or our needs. But as he says in verse 10, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances. So uh, the title of this lesson is Christ's Sacrifice. And uh, so now we've made that transition into uh, the part that deals with the higher way, the new covenant. Chapter uh, 9, verses 11 through 12. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And uh, you see that my illustrative image is a cross, a crown of thorns and nails with some blood. And let me point out in this context, this which is a cup of wine and unleavened bread. So uh, we celebrate Christ's death, as you know, every time we partake of the communion, we are uh, really not only commemorating, but celebrating Christ's death again until he comes. So verses 13 through 14, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer 
sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from deadly works to serve the living God? So I think that's, again, self-explanatory. Those acts which involved literal blood, the sprinkling of the people with uh, these, frankly, unclean substances, blood and ash, uh, they were not sufficient for the purifying of conscience, for rectifying God's enmity with us, and it took a higher sacrifice. It took the blood of Christ who, as he says, through the eternal spirit, offered himself just as that unblemished lamb without spot to God in order to cleanse our conscience from vain and dead works. Verses 15, or verse 15, and for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the internal inheritance. So I focus here on the word mediator, which in the Greek is mesites, and that is the word that is used here in chapter 9, verses, verse 15. And I think we all know what this means. It means basically the same thing in the Greek that it means in the English a person who attempts to make people involved in a conflict come to an agreement, a go-between, one who intervenes between two, either in order to make or restore peace and friendship or form a compact or for ratifying a covenant. And uh, in fact, this kind of language has already been used previously by the Hebrews author in chapter 7, verse 25. It's a little bit different, but the basic meaning is the same. Here the word intinkenii is used, intinkenii, which means in English intercessor. And that is someone who entreats or pleads the cause of someone else. So Christ is our mediator. He is our intercessor. God has a grievance with us because of sin. And because of that, we all stand uh, really guilty and therefore culpable and answerable on a capital charge. But Christ, through his own offering of his own blood, is our mediator, our intercessor. He comes between us and God, and uh, he uh, works out the differences between us. His blood serves to solidify the covenant or compact. So, uh, chapter 9, verses 16 through 18. And this is language here that I think all of us can well understand. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. So everyone knows what a will is. A will, last will and testament, that's your decision about how you will leave your personal assets upon the time of your death. And usually they are quite complex and the lawyers have to draw them up to make sure the wording is correct and that there's no doubt about what's going on and who gets what. But before it can be put into practice, the principal has to die. And uh, I think uh, the analogy here is very clear, and that is Christ's death establishes a new covenant. We call it the New Testament, the new uh, body. But it's better than the typical one because in this case, the testator, the principal, is still alive. God raised him again. Well, we go back to a little bit more of the analogy with the old law, because in verse 19 we read, For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats, hence my splotch of red again, with water 
If you look closely, there's a little flask of water there. Scarlet wool, that runs right through. And hyssop. And uh, those are the purple plants with the fine leaves that you see in the background and at the bottom. And sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. So I think we understand water. Water is a natural purifying agent. There's no problem with that. Uh, we have begun to consider the purifying nature of blood, although in some ways it seems dichotomous to think about sprinkling things with blood by way of purifying. Nevertheless, this was part of God's plan. And then the scarlet uh, wool, uh, the reference here apparently comes from Isaiah, who can make our sins, though they be as scarlet, as white as snow. I'm not a dyer. I've never dyed anything in my life, but it's my understanding that if you if you dye something scarlet or crimson, that's that. It's not going to come out. And uh, so this is a metaphor that speaks of God's cleansing his people because he is, after all, God, and he can do the impossible. The hyssop is another uh, thing that symbolically references spiritual cleansing. And uh, one of the most memorable places for this is in Psalm 51. If you remember this powerful psalm where the prophet Nathan has brought home to David the gravity of his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah, and he prays to God in uh, a broken spirit. And in that passage, verse 7 of chapter 51 of Psalm, he speaks of being cleansed with hyssop. So hyssop is a fragrant uh, herb with many leaves and these beautiful purple flowers. It can actually be used for cooking, but it's uh, minty, aromatic, and uh, so uh, that's the association, as I understand it, with cleansing. But it was part of the old law as regards cleansing things uh, for uh, sanctification. So then likewise, uh, chapter 9, verses 21 through 22, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Well, uh, perhaps some people, I, I know I've heard of this anecdotally, uh, who want to question God's purposes and his will, uh, might say this, why sacrifice? Why the shedding of blood? Really? I mean, God is God. He can just wave his magic wand and do what he wants. And please understand me, in using that kind of language, I am not being irreverent. I'm putting myself for just a moment in the place of that person who wants to say that God can do whatever and there, there need not be any price to pay. That we should be free to do what we want. Well, that's simple. And more than that, that's simplistic. And frankly, it's just wrong. Our own sense of justice and integrity knows that it's wrong. You leave here tonight and you get hit by somebody, it's their fault, and they don't pony up, you're going to be angry. That's not fair. That's unjust. <laughs> Where do you think that comes from? Our inherent sense of right and wrong comes from God because he is the fount of that and all of our virtues. So uh, what I offer now is simply my own thoughts. I think they are biblically sound, but uh, in any case, here would be my response to that if you can read this. Number one, God's sense of justice means that sin cannot be ignored or forgiven without cost. As I've just alluded by that simple example a moment ago, this would make God unjust. Number two, in the very beginning, before the original sin, chapter 3 of Genesis, God warned humanity that the consequences of sin would be death. To ignore that would make God a liar. 
Are we really going to put God in that position by demanding that he forgive us without any penalty? I won't. I don't have that kind of nerve. Number three, God's holy nature should not be impugned by sinful, unrepentant humanity. Any and all sin is an affront to the God of righteousness. And these are just the three that jumped out to my mind immediately. Um, again, I believe they're all scripturally sound, uh, but I'm sure many others could, become up, uh, could be brought up as well. So having said that, uh, hesitantly, let me ask, are there any questions? <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have said hesitantly. Comments? Well, again, there's, there's much more that could be examined in this area, but uh, for the sake of our time, we've got about nine minutes. Let's, let's push on. Chapter 9, verse 23. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So I take uh, the copies of the things to refer to these practices that are in the law, but the real things, the heavenly things, the things that are genuinely bought by the blood of Christ, the oneness with God being brought into a state of union with him again, demanded something better. So uh, by way of trying to sum up this, I uh, developed this chart. And uh, basically, again, this just summarizes everything that I've gone through, but I hope it's helpful. Uh, the fleshly refers here, as he has often used it, to the Mosaical law, and the spiritual refers to the New Covenant, the New Testament, uh, that was brought into uh, really uh, purpose and possibility at the time of Christ's death on the cross. And that's one reason why I have the golden cross in the middle between these two. So the Mosaical law, and note the little arrow here, uh, really was fulfilled in the cross of Christ. And the new covenant is brought to fruition by Christ's death on the cross. So under the fleshly or the Mosaical law, we have a physical tabernacle. In the new covenant, the spiritual, we have the spiritual body, the church. Under the old law, the Jews were an elect people through whom the Messiah would come. But thanks to the sacrifice of Christ, then the waters of grace are flooding and all peoples are welcomed, Jew and Gentile, into the spiritual body. The old law had a Levitical priesthood, a specially sanctified group of people from the tribe of Levi who served as priests. But in the new covenant, we're all priests. We're all saints. We're explicitly called both. Of course, to officiate uh, properly in the old law, you had to have a high priest ordained, chosen by God. But our high priest is, of course, Jesus Christ, who is both sacrifice and priest at the same time, after the order of Melchizedek without end. The fleshly law had a written law, the uh, five books. And uh, we know from the uh, minor prophets, uh, I didn't have the time to refresh my memory on the exact book, chapter, and verse, but uh, we know that in the new covenant, the law is to be enshrined in our hearts. We are to live it out, not simply recite it, check off things uh, legalistically, but it's to be lived. It's to be enshrined here. The Mosaical law involved many physical implements, as we've seen, I take the counterpart here to be the acts of worship as given to us in the New Testament pattern. Uh, prayer, meditation, study of God's word, uh, exhorting and encouraging one another, singing songs and hymns of praise, and engaging in the Lord's Supper. 
Of course, the uh, fleshly law was uh, consecrated, among other things, by the blood of bulls and goats. But we have a much higher sacrifice than that, Christ's on death on the cross. The fleshly law was offered frequently. The, uh, the sacrifice of Christ, of course, is offered once and for all. So uh, that pretty much sums up, as I understand it, what is going on here in chapter 9. But I thought that I would also refer you to another Pauline kind of thing, because this, I think, is one of the reasons why so many have thought that Paul was the author of the Hebrews uh, epistle, because in Galatians 4, 21 through 24, he uses another metaphor to make the same argument. And uh, here are the pertinent voice verses here. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. And of course, he's referring to Hagar and Sarah. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. So Hagar and Ishmael represent the old covenant in this Pauline metaphor. And he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic. And of course, he's speaking of the promised son, Isaac, born through Sarah of Abraham. And uh, they represent here the new covenant. So chapter 9, verses 24 through 26. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And uh, I don't know about you, but maybe you're thinking 2,000 years ago, and yet at the end of the ages? Well, um, I've got some thoughts about this too. And as with uh, what I've shared with you already, uh, these could certainly be added to. But here are my thoughts about referring to Christ's, Christ's sacrifice as being one that was offered at the end of the ages. So uh, I often think of human history following what I call the biological model, birth, childhood, growth, old age, death. And uh, just as that applies to the individual, so I think it can apply to nations, to uh, all kinds of peoples, even to the human species. And uh, so I would maintain that following the biological model, Christ's death marks the ending of the ages in God's mind. Uh, he is the consummate fulfillment of God's plan that will bring man back into a state of union with him if we so choose to take advantage of that. So we're not talking about human reckoning or human history in this reason. We're talking about God's plan. And uh, therefore, I think it could be rightly said that uh, following the biological model, humanity is mature. We've been taken through the various stages of growth and development that mark the ancient world. And uh, at the right time, as we're told in the scriptures, God saw fit to bring forth his son. And uh, so uh, that's how I understand this, that the ending of the ages means that uh, however much time humanity has, however much more time the world spends, uh, we're in that, that latter cycle. And uh, one of my great examples for the biological model is Hosea chapter 11, because there, in de grieving the departure of Israel like a prostitute, she's abandoned him. Uh, Hosea, inspired by God, speaks on behalf of God and says, chapter 11, verses 1 and, uh, let's see, 2 and 3, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. As they called them, so they went from them. 
They sacrificed to the Baals and burned incense to carved images. I taught Ephraim, another name for Israel, to walk, taking them by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love. So God is using himself, the biological model here, and talking about his relationship with his people and how close it was like that of a loving father and a son who is so young that he has to be held by the arms and literally taught how to walk. Another reason. For the spirit, physical death is likened to the sleep of the body. So no less than 54 times in the Bible, death is referred to as sleep. And uh, we're out of time, so I don't have the time to go into any or all of that. But one of the best examples is John chapter 11, where Christ tells his disciples, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. And we all know he's dead. But the disciples didn't, and they say, well, if he's asleep, then let him sleep. He'll get better. And Christ plainly tells them Lazarus is dead. So uh, sleep is actually a metaphor for death. And uh, what follows is a further reinforcement of what I'm saying. But let me add this. In the Greek, kwameo means to sleep, to fall asleep, or to die. And uh, both that as well as kathudo, sleep or sleeping, are used commonly in the Bible. And it really depends upon the context as regards which meaning is being used, death or physical sleep. Uh, incidentally, koimiterion is the Greek words for place of sleep. Our word cemetery comes from that. So a cemetery is a place of sleep. So in this sense, the sleep of death, the end comes on a daily basis. And I think that's incredible. Christ, in a sense, is coming all the time because people are dying all the time. And uh, they close their eyes in death. And uh, if this metaphor is as apt as I believe it to be, they will raise their eyes in eternity and the judgment will begin. So in that sense, it's almost an immediate thing. But here's a comforting thought. God loves us. He knows death is fearful. Do you fear when you lay down at night to go to sleep physically? I don't. I anticipate rest. I anticipate peace. I anticipate being free of the burdens that I'm carrying mentally and emotionally. God lets us practice every night. Why should Christians fear death? Well, my last uh, bullet point here is, what is time to eternal God? <laughs> I don't think I need to answer that. I'm already out of time. So am I saying there will be no second coming? Of course I'm not. I'm not saying that by any means. Uh, verse 27 makes this clear. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So uh, again, we're out of time. So uh, let me just encourage you all to read chapter 10. And uh, any last minute thoughts? Well, if not, then let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your immutability, that you are unchanging, that you will be faithful, that you are always forgiving to those who seek you in, for, in repentance, and that uh, with those promises and assurances, we need not fear death. We need only forward to being with you and our loved ones who have passed on to be with you. I pray, Lord, that we would take these thoughts and they would be encouraging to us as we go forward through the remainder of this week. I pray that we might always take as infinitely precious your words, your will, and your ways, and that we might strive to enshrine them in our hearts and share them with those around us. I pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen.